Hello and thanks for asking me to the Newington Common People event. I wish I could be there in person. Here I briefly describe the study of working class access to the Greek and Roman classics, published as a book last year as Classics and Class, co-written with Dr Henry Stead. Now classics, the study of the languages and civilization of ancient Greece and Rome, is usually assumed to have functioned historically as the curriculum of the British elite. And this book is the first substantial inquiry into the presence of ancient Greek and Roman culture in British working class communities. We think that it alters our understanding of the history of classics irrevocably by examining evidence for the diverse working class experience of the classical world between the Bill of Rights in 1689 and the outbreak of World War II. The evidence includes autobiographies, poetry, fiction, visual, material culture in museums, galleries and the civic environment, theatrical ephemera, records of trade union activities, self-education publications, mass market inexpensive classic series, archives relating to poor, free, workers, adult and dissenting educational establishments and to political parties which supported the working class. The book asks how workers gained access to classical texts, ideas and materials and how the contact affected their lives and attitudes. Although there was a significant amount of working class engagement with the ancient Greeks and Romans, most of which has hitherto been almost completely overlooked, it was very hard won. The time-consuming study of the Greek and Latin languages was adopted as the core of classics, the education of the newly redefined British gentleman at the dawn of the 18th century, whether his fees were paid by landed estates or commerce. It symbolised his fitness for a profession, a marriage into the gentry, a career in prestigious educational institutions or government, or advancement in the civil or colonial services. By the end of the second decade of the 18th century, the battle lines which still shape debates over classics had already been drawn up. Britons who were unable or unwilling to bankroll their sons' classical educations fought back. The Greeks and Romans could be approached by other routes which did not require years glued to grammars and dictionaries. They could increasingly be read in mother tongue translations, often by great poets like Dryden and Pope, even though this was obviously derided as a, a vulgar mode of access to the classics by those who had coughed up for the linguistic training. The material covered in ancient authors could be enjoyed even by completely illiterate people in accessible entertainments such as fairground shows. Our first section asks what classics related cultural media and literary genres were accessed and in turn used as vehicles by working class subjects. In the 18th century, some autodidacts in lowly occupations succeeded in learning classical languages against all odds, while others accessed classical authors via those increasingly abundant translations in the 19th century, when widening literacy and inexpensive literature, especially many educational publications of John Castle, expanded access to classics exponentially. Although Homer, Virgil and Caesar were universally popular, the authors prioritised by working class readers actually differed from those read in expensive schools and elite colleges. They liked the Greek New Testament, Aesop, Plutarch, Epictetus, Josephus, Plato and Livy, and a particular canon of historians of antiquity like Rollin, Gibbon and Osborne Ward recur on working class reading lists. Labouring class poets, both male and female, such as Stephen Duck and Mary Collier, publish collections which display knowledge of classical forebears. Now, some use it to flatter their rich patrons, others use it to challenge social injustice. And life writing by workers reveals a similar gulf between those who embraced what they perceived as their escape from their natal class and those who never ceased to work in its cause. What unites many working class autobiographies is a useful encounter with classics, which transforms the subject's life trajectory. 
whether by inspiring a programme of self-education or by proving to him and almost all the 19th century worker autobiographers are male, proving to him the extent of his educational deprivation. Until the later 19th century, a large proportion of the British working class, especially women, remained illiterate. And the book explores their engagement with visual media, which informed them about classical sculpture. The windows of print shops, aristocratic and civic architecture and internal decor, museums, spectacles, illustrated educational periodicals. And since drawing, painted decoration and modelling often attracted apprentices from really impoverished backgrounds, the visual understanding of sites such as Pompeii and the Athenian Acropolis were often provided by originally working class men with an artistic talent. Theatrical performances provided another route to the classical world, although the censorship of stage plays limited the use of rousing ancient stories in plays exploring the iniquities of the glass system. The case of a censored tragedy about the Gracchi brothers, produced just before and after Peter Lou, provides a vivid example. Contact with classics vary between different communities and section two explores religious identity, adult educational groups, the national experiences in Ireland, Scotland and Wales. Dissenters of all denominations were crucial in making classical authors available to Britons across the lower end of the class spectrum. And dissenters also often led major educational initiatives offering opportunities to the working classes to study subjects, including classics. Mutual improvement societies, adult schools, mechanics institutes, university extension schemes, the Workers' Educational Association, WA, and the Labour Colleges. The relationship between the Irish and the Greco-Roman world was intense, as their literature in both Gaelic and English reveals. Competence in Latin was fostered across even some of the lowest classes by Roman Catholicism and in formal education at hedge schools. But Irish political allegiances were complicated along with classically skilled working class Catholics who supported Irish rebellion, some ardently opposed it. Two radical Irish classicists campaigning in the interests of the Irish working classes were Protestant. Robert Tressel, author of the Plato-influenced working class novel The Ragged Trousers Philanthropists of 1914, was himself of mixed religious parentage. In Scotland, the proud tradition of the Lad of Perts boasts a long-standing reputation for good working class education. And there were indeed remarkable resources for studying and teaching the classics in the counties, especially around Aberdeen. And these furnished hundreds of educated men to work in the furthest outposts of the British Empire. Cheap and publishing, popular publishing ventures were also founded by Scotsmen, especially the Chambers Brothers. Two of the most important books in British Labour history were Thomas Carlyle's Classically Informed Past and Present and Lewis Grassic Gibbon's Spartacus. Wales had a distinct non-conformist tradition of classical education, but it also had Caractacus, the ancient British leader who, according to Tacitus, had fought against the Romans in Wales and was paired in the public imagination with David Lloyd George. And there was an Edwardian craze in Wales for amateur theatrical performances by school children starring Caractacus. And once World War I broke out, these became transparently connected with recruitment, morale and fundraising for the war effort. Individual working class subjects teetering on or below the edge of respectability are put at the centre of our radar in section three. Between the French Revolution and the collapse of the Chartist movement, diverse British radicals, so Republican revolutionaries of the 1790s, men incarcerated for sedition in the aftermath of Peterloo, Chartists, workplace organisers and free thinkers, some working class and some from more prosperous backgrounds. All of these 
were motivated by the ancient Greeks and Romans. They used classics to enliven their journalism, inform arguments at trials, and explore religious questions that took them far beyond the limits of Anglican theology. A few outstanding autodidacts harnessed classics to assist, yet, assist their meteoric rise to university chairs, where most of them relinquished class anger to become quietist professionals. But the attempts of other extraordinary working class boys to escape poverty by self-education never quite got off the ground. Some ended their days as itinerants, alcoholics, or suffering from acute mental disorders. The aura surrounding the ancient cultures did not signify gentlemanliness and financial security everywhere. Alongside the gentry enjoying their palladian, palladian mansions and expensive school curriculums, there always existed more commercial, demotic, subterranean and secretive groups in British society who used imagery from the Greek and Roman worlds to communicate and self-identify. Salesmen, imposters, criminals, prostitutes, circus and fairground performers, showgirls, libertines, madmen and participants in recreational activities ranging from the merely vulgar to the absolutely illegal. Ancient Greek appeared in a variety of recherche contexts such as accusations of witchcraft, caricatures of Jesuits, the slang dialect of the criminal underclass, the display of prodigiously intellectual dogs and pigs, fairground freaks including satyrs and centaurs, the lives of notoriously uncouth Scotsmen, Welsh dream divination and downmarket pharmaceuticals and sex manuals. A few classicists unambiguously joined the underclass in being convicted of violent crimes and or confined in asylums. The most beauty and strength performers in the long 19th century, dancers, actresses, strongmen, contortionists, strong women, wrestlers, boxers, novelty performers, artist models, and posers of all kind. They all used draped fabric, leather straps and bared flesh to identify their acts with Greco-Roman antiquity. They also almost always came from working class families. The final section, four, examines the presence of classical material in other working lives. The figures from antiquity with whom the working class is identified or were identified with by others were male martyrs, rebels, slaves and labourers, largely distinct from the heroes and gods instrumentalised by those higher up the social scale, such as Alexander, Aeneas, Augustus, Jove and Juno, Leto, Apollo, Diana, Venus and Mars. Sources including working, workers' newspapers and trade union art show that workers identified with Aesop, both Brutuses, the Gracchi, Solon, Caractacus, Bodicea, Spartacus, Prometheus, Vulcan, Hercules labours, Atlas, the Cyclopes and Neptune. Hercules and Atlas were violently contested, being used to symbolise both ruling class imperial dominion and the physical power of the proletariat. Shoemakers, often radical nonconformists, although sometimes espousing conservative views, were well read and conversant with classical authors inspired by the examples of learned cobblers they found in ancient sources. Pottery workers were familiar with ancient artefacts and with books visually reproducing and discussing them. Miners, especially in Scotland and Wales, enjoyed some of the best workers' libraries, well stocked with classics in the nation. As working class activism increased with the rise of the labour movement, Classically self-educated professional politicians rose from the working classes and their cause was espoused by newly university trained socialist women. The academic classicists who joined the Communist Party of Great Britain and also classically trained full-time activists and intellectuals such as Christopher Cordwell and Jack Lindsay. Accessing the experience of working class soldiers is exceptionally difficult, but one war poet, David Jones, wasn't of officer rank. His neglected epic prose poem, In Parenthesis of 1937, forged a radically new classicism, modernist form and demotic language 
for the representation of the common soldier's subjective experience of the trenches. And these are prefigured by the frontier walls of the Roman Empire. A People's History of Classics closes with the class conscious and sophisticated classical theatre, which was pioneered by Theatre Workshop, founded by the working class communist theatre makers Joan Littlewood and Ewan McColl. Now, they used Greek drama to fight the culture wars of the 1930s for the rights of the working classes. The British working classes were almost universally excluded from institutionalised classics and from study of ancient languages, but a few overcame the obstacles. Many more engaged with the ancient Greeks and Romans in myriad creative ways. The classical world aided their careers, expanded their horizons, improved their rhetoric, informed their politics, alleviated their boredom, inspired them to read, write, paint, draw, sculpt, act perform, teach, publish, organise trade unions, join debating societies, read the Gospels in the original, or question the existence of God altogether. They used classics to prove their intellectual calibre, to express their plight, and signal their consciousness of the class system. But they also used it to subvert and undermine the authority of the classes that ruled them, and to entertain themselves during their scanty leisure hours. The heroes of people's classics that we write about were gardeners, stonemasons, circus acrobats, factory operatives, engravers, cutlers, domestic servants, brewers, weavers, tramps, beggars, prisoners, thieves, inmates of mental hospitals, plasterers, painter decorators, cabin boys, milkmaids, washerwomen, Wool sorters, drummers, butchers, grocers, mechanics, carpenters, errand boys, tailors, pill sellers, janitors, porters, dockers, hatters, fishermen, sailors, comb makers, bakers, bricklayers, navvies, shepherds, threshers, and grave diggers. They deserve honoured places in the gallery of people's classics simply because they struggled so hard to get access to the ancient world but they also offer us a new ancestral backstory for my discipline, which is sorely in need of a democratic makeover. Thank you.